Good evening. Tonight's story is The Christmas Log by Louis Honoré Frechet. It's from his book Christmas in French Canada, published in 1899. This is not a traditional Christmas story, but it is a story full of Christmas traditions. It depicts different ways of celebrating the holiday, describing very specific local customs while also relating a myth of the man in the moon. I find it both charming and interesting, and I hope you feel the same way. So now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Grandmama, tell us a story, please. A story, a story, Grandmama. A Christmas story. The story of the man in the moon. You promised to tell it. And the pretty heads, fair and dark, with opened mouths and sparkling eyes, gathered around the rocking chair of Grandmama, who, her spectacles on her nose, after treating herself to a pinch of Spanish snuff, took her network, threw a glance around, which brought a smile on her wrinkled lips, dropped her woolen ball into the apron of the youngest, began to move her knitting needles rapidly with her long and slender fingers, and then commenced in a slightly quivering voice. Once upon a time, my children. At this moment, there was a stir amongst the listeners. Everyone moved in his place. The tallest gave a little cough. The most attentive leaned forward with elbows on knees and chin in hands. Then there was a hush, and everyone began to listen with mouth, eyes, and ears. Once upon a time, my children, repeated the old lady as she went on with her knitting. There was an old chateau, very old indeed, very gloomy and solitary, standing on the rocky flank of a hill crowned by a forest of large oaks and named the Castle of Carrefour. I mean that this was its real name, for it was better known in the country as the Devil's Tower. In fact, it was said that in the old days, the devil had built a forge and furnace in one of the highest rooms of the turret, where he made gold for the owners of the domain, who, for his services, belonged to him from generation to generation. There must have been some evil source for the wealth of these wretched miscreants, for, from the top of their towers, one could make out nothing but barren and dry moors, planted here and there, with big fairy stones standing up like men, which are called in Brittany menhirs, or Satan's distaffs. For I must tell you, my children, that the story I am about to tell took place in France, in the old province called Brittany, where the grandmother of my own grandmother came from when our people settled in this land of America. Well, in the days I am speaking of, the Lord of Carrefour, the owner of the Devil's Tower, was named Robert. He was crippled from birth, bandy-legged and club-footed, and this deformity, which did not prevent his being strong as a giant, had not lightly contributed to the diabolical reputation he had gained by his ill-tempered, ungoverned, and thoroughly bad character. Brought up like a heathen, he had passed his youth hunting wild boars in the woods even on Sundays and other holy days, harrying the poor peasants, blaspheming the name of God, and indulging in all sorts of wickedness. He was never seen in church. He never uncovered his head before the Calvaries he passed on his way. He shamelessly ate meat on Fridays and laughed with impudence at funerals. People pretended they had seen him at night, limping on his twisted leg far away on the moor, in company with the great big stones I told you of, which followed him like dogs in the moonlight, without anybody being able to tell where he was going. In short, the Count Robert de Carrefour was a wretched sinner, fearing neither God nor Satan sneering at holy things, and although quite young yet, had, by this impious and sacrilegious conduct, caused his mother's death from a broken heart. 
As to his father, whose life had hardly been better than his son's, he had died without confession in a corner of the forest where his body had been found half-devoured by wolves. It was a sad end indeed, but the son was to finish still more miserably, as you shall see. No interruption was to be heard in the little group. On the contrary, not even a finger moved. Every word, every syllable was snapped up, and the attention of the small audience increased as the good old lady went on with her narrative. You have seen the man in the moon, have you not, my children? Yes, Grandmama. A lame man, who is going downhill, with a bundle of straw on his shoulders. No, a bundle of sticks. A log, children, a burning log. One can see him clearly at night when the stars glitter in the sky and when the full moon rolls her silvery disk between us and the blue depths of the firmament, especially on the holy Christmas night when Santa Claus goes from house to house with his presents for the good little children, when the church windows mingle their rosy glare with the pale lights which fall from heaven on the snow-covered hills. You have seen him, have you not? Yes, Yes, Grandmama, with the log on his shoulder. Yes, and with his crooked leg. Well, listen now. And the little circle pressed once more around the rocking chair, while Grandmama continued. In Brittany, the valiant land of Brittany, in that good old fatherland of our forefathers, Christmas was not celebrated as it is here, where we simply attend midnight mass and drink a glass of liquor, nibbling a branch of croquignol sprinkled with powdered sugar. There it was the peasant's day, the feast of the poor, and the country festival above all others. The folk gathered in the chateaus and large farmhouses, and there young and old waited for midnight mass with all manner of rejoicing. First, they had what was called the Christmas log, a huge fragment cut from the trunk of a tree, prepared and well dried beforehand, which was burnt in the great chimney place after having been baptized by dropping over it a brimmer of wine from the last vintage after which they sang the old carols and feasted with cider and newels. Newels, you know, were crusty little cakes baked for Christmas only. No Christmas was complete without them. So they used to crunch newels, crunch newels, you understand, evidently the origin of our croquignols, and they danced. Ah, well, our forefathers had not the fine pianos we have today, the violin itself was still unknown in the villages of Brittany. No waltzes, nor quadrilles, nor even cotillions. Boys and girls danced the beret and the carole to the sound of the biniou, an instrument something like you have seen with the Scotch regiments. No floors brilliantly waxed either, my children, nor oriental carpets, nor elegant shining pumps. But people did not enjoy it the less for that, I fancy. At all events, it was not the harmonious click-clack of the beech tree shoes on the resounding flagstones that could spoil the music. And, as you can easily imagine, my pets, the Holy Christmas was not celebrated in this fashion at the Devil's Tower. The people at the chateau on that night did, but as we do here, they simply went to church to adore the divine infant in his manger, and returned sidedly to gather around the hearth where the old gamekeeper Lego Fic, like your grandmamas today, used to relate some old story or sing some old carol, but in a very low voice, of course, for fear of being overheard by the master. And it was thus, over and over, from one season to another, the years following in sadness and fear, without a moment of gaiety, without a glimmer of joyousness. One morning it happened that Count Robert sent for his steward, Yvonne Kerouac, and had a long talk with him. Then he ordered his best steed to be saddled, and with a heavy travelling bag well buckled on the croup, he started away without saying a word to a living soul. Where did he go? Nobody ever knew. Months followed weeks, and years months, without bringing the slightest news of him. 
After a long while, he was supposed to be dead, and everyone made the sign of the cross on his breast with his thumb on hearing the name of the Count de Kerfoul, who must have been the victim of some dreadful punishment, and who surely would never be seen again in this life, and, if it pleased God, in the other either. Twenty years had gone by. The steward, the housekeeper, and other servants had grown grey. The old watchman Le Gofic counted over eighty years, and everyone having become convinced that the absentee would never return, a more peaceful life had introduced itself by degrees, if not under the lofty ceilings of the state rooms, at least under the smoked rafters of the common hall, where the peasants and shepherds of the neighborhood occasionally gathered on public festivals or days of rest to enjoy themselves. In short, thanks to the disappearance of Count Robert, the inhabitants of the old chateau had begun to lead a more quiet and happy life, and merry times became as frequent at the Devil's Tower as anywhere else. Especially on Christmas Eve was their joyful merrymaking and abundant feasting under the battlements of the old tower, which might not have failed in time to acquire a Christian reputation if the tragical event I am going to relate had not added its fantastic page to the old legend. One year, the inhabitants of the chateau had made up their minds to celebrate Christmas Eve with exceptional splendor. A huge billet cut out of one of the giant oaks of the park had been prepared for the ceremony, and, as early as eight o'clock in the evening, all the neighbors, the Benue player heading, crowded into the large hall of the chateau, illuminated by rosin and torches and the lively blaze which already caressed the Christmas log, proudly installed right in the center of the hearth. The foaming cider was passed round, stimulating joyous repartees and provoking explosions of laughter among the feasters, and each one swallowed his bumper to the ringing of the rustic goblets, while, and through it all, droned the long and snuffling notes of the binu. Suddenly, Noel! Noel! cried all the voices in one enthusiastic acclamation, which made the old Gothic windows with their colored and leaded panes tinkle. The Christmas log had just taken fire, crackling and spreading all about showers of brilliant sparks. The baptism! The baptism! cried everyone. Uncle Lego Feet, to you the honors of the ceremony! Come! Baptize the Christmas log, Uncle Lego Fique. Uncle Lego Fique. Uncle Lego Fique. And all fell on their knees while the old gamekeeper, with bare head, advanced toward the large fireplace, whose light shone like a glory around his long white hair, outlining as on a golden background the majestic and imposing figure of the old man. In the name of the father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, said he, in a low and solemn tone, while his naughty and trembling hand dropped a ruby-like string of wine on the heavy fragment of oak, bitten by the winding blaze. The bystanders had not time to answer all men, before a wild gust of wind swept aside the flames at the hearth, and in the opened door stood the evil and deformed figure of Count Robert de Kerfoul. Everyone stood up, dumb and horrified. After a moment of deadly silence, the newcomer threw a ferocious glance about, and with a drawn sword advanced through the terrified peasants toward the chimney. Par le mon Dieu, cried he, with a haughty and thundering voice. Since when has my dwelling house become the scene of such ridiculous mummeries? Joel! added he, as he turned toward his old groom and pointed to the blazing fire. Throw away this emblem of accursed superstition. An exclamation of terror followed. The Christmas log? Yes, the Christmas log. Out of this with it. Do you hear me, Joel? My lord count, replied Joel, kneeling down in fear. The Christmas log is sacred. I'd rather die than touch it. The Count Robert was crazy with rage. By all the devils, yelled he, addressing the steward, whom he had just detected in the crowd. Who commands here, Yvonne Kerouac? My lord Count, replied the steward. The Christmas log is hallowed. 
to touch it would be a crime. It would be a crime, repeated all like an echo. At this, the exasperation of the miscreant knew no bounds. Stupid idiots, cried he. And then, laying hold of two jugs of cider, he emptied them over the burning log and pulled the same with his own hands out of the fireplace and lifted it to his shoulder without regard to the firebrands which singed his hair and shriveled his skin. My lord, count, besought the old gamekeeper, shivering from head to foot. The Christmas log has been baptized. Beware of God's hand, my lord, count. Sacrilege! exclaimed several voices, as, limping in a dreadful fashion, his back bent under the weight of the smoking billet, the Count stepped across the threshold and, with horrible blasphemies, disappeared in the outside darkness. "'Let us kneel down!' cried old Legofique. But it was too late. A terrible cry of distress, which had in it nothing human, sounded in the night, raising up the hair of all the witnesses of the terrible scene. And never again was the Count Robert de Carrefour, the last lord of the Devil's Tower, seen amongst the living. Ever since that night, my children, one can see on the shining disk of the moon in clear weather a man with a twisted knee stooping under a strange burden in which those who see clearly enough can make out a half-burnt log still flaming here and there. The unfortunate Count Robert is condemned to carry the burden on his shoulder until the day of the last judgment. And it is he we see in the moon, Grandmama? They say so, my children. With the Christmas log? Yes, my children. With his crooked leg and his club foot? Yes. Is that story true? Asked one of the urchins, who had listened most attentively and with the most widely opened eyes. Pshaw, said the tallest of the girls. A fairy tale. Well, of course, my children, said the grandmother, smilingly. You asked me for a Christmas story. I have related you what was related to me when I was a child. You may do the same in your turn when you are old. Let your listeners believe if they wish. There are myths and fables and stories about the man in the moon going back to prehistory, and many European myths specifically depict the man carrying a bundle of sticks. In fact, in German mythology, he's a woodcutter who's punished for working on the Sabbath. In the Old Netherlands, he's specifically connected with Christmas, an old Frisian tale says that the man was caught stealing cabbages on Christmas Eve and that he can be seen every Christmas time. Dante's Inferno also references that the man in the moon is the biblical Cain, similarly caught stealing vegetables. But of course, the man in the moon legend is just a tiny part of this story. The Christmas log really has everything that I like for this channel. It has an obscure local legend, along with some spiritual practices, along with history and daily life in both French Canada of the late 19th century and of Brittany in the late 18th or early 19th century. It touches on food, dance, religion, superstition, Christmas, natural history. It has standing stones, the baptizing of logs, holiday traditions, etymology, and it's all packed into just a few pages of text. It's actually amazing to me that a story ostensibly about the man in the moon can also be about Christmas and the Devil's Tower and Crocodile. So, naturally, this story sent me down something of a rabbit hole looking for the Chateau de Carrefour in Brittany. There is no such thing. There is no Carrefour anything in France. However, I personally have a theory that the story might be referring to the Chateau de Carrefour. The name and the pronunciation may have evolved, especially if you consider that the grandmother is repeating a story told to her by her grandparents, and then the book was probably written decades later and in a different language. 
The Chateau de Kerfeli is near the wonderfully named Elven France in southern Brittany. It's situated near several Bronze Age sites with menhirs and dolmens. It dates back as early as the 15th century. It's at a slight elevation. I think it fits. There are, of course, a ton of place names that might be a close match. There's a Kergol and a Caravello, and I haven't scrutinized every chateau in Morbihan in Brittany, where most of the megaliths are. And of course, I can't find anything about something as vague as a Count Robert associated with any chateau in southern Brittany. In fact, the de Saron family held the Chateau Kerfelet, and there wasn't a Robert among them. But I also spent way too long on this, and it's probably all speculation anyway. Who knows how and if this myth actually connects with history. So we are once again this week in Christmas in French Canada with Louis-Honoré Frachet. There is some biographical information about him in the Lou Garou, so I'll link that video here. In the introduction to this book, he talks about his idea to share with English speakers a few sketches of real life in French Canada. He charmingly admits that English is not his native language, and that it is, quote, a sufficiently difficult task to learn how to master one's own mother tongue, end quote, but that he would find it enjoyable to write in English, and he wanted to reach English-speaking readers. And shout out again to illustrator Frederick Simpson Coburn, whose images have appeared in this video. This week's confession is that I want to go to Elven France. Look at it! And it's surrounded by all these crazy Neolithic sites. I want to see them. They have these two stones with faces on them. They look like Miyazaki characters. I love it. I love the little villages of France. I love the diversity of the architecture and the history and the culture and the climate. These wonderful timber frame buildings that are in Brittany and Normandy, and they're just gorgeous. And it's not a style you typically associate with French architecture and can't be found anywhere else in the country. Well, in Alsace, I guess. One of the most wonderful things about Europe is that nearly every village, even very small ones, has a distinct local history and a coat of arms and a song and sometimes a dialect or a political structure and often, especially in France, a special food or a pastry or a handcraft or something. Europe is so fractal to me. It's like no matter how much you narrow your focus and zoom in, you find more and more detail and complexity instead of things averaging out and becoming similar. You are listening to Restored Lore, where every week we share old, odd, and overlooked stories from around the world. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and select notifications so you never miss a story. Please also like this video, make a comment, or share it with someone who would enjoy it so we can keep this little community growing. I love you guys. I'll see you next week.